And I'd like to introduce uh, Andy Lake and Mark Fight from uh, Internet2, and Andy's from ESNet, and they're going to be talking about Personar. So I'll turn it over to Andy. Go ahead, Andy. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so thanks for uh, having us here today. Uh, so as Jason said today, uh, Mark and I will be talking about Personar in particular, uh, what to expect over the next couple of releases. Um, so basically from uh, now until the early part of next year. Um, so we'll go over that. Um, oh, one second. There we go. A uh, little bit of lag there. Um, so yeah, so here's all the things we'll cover. So, so basically, um, I'll, I'll do a brief intro and kind of recap what we've rolled out the past couple months. Um, then we'll roll into 402, which is actually pretty close. Uh, November 2017 is what we're shooting for, and actually a beta a couple weeks weeks from now. Um, so that that's uh, stuff that's coming up right away. And then uh, we'll look at a little further out, which is early next year, our next major release, which will be uh, 41, and then what we're thinking about and already developing for for that. Um, so I know most of the people here already know what Persona is. So this is my only slide like this. Uh, <laughs> I promise. Uh, really kind of more uh, just to feel obligated to put it if somebody looks at the slides later. But, but anyways, Persona is a, uh, really a set of set of uh, uh, software to help uh, to perform network measurements with the goals of you know those bullets there of, of helping find network problems and particular soft failures, which are the type of failures where basic connectivity works. But um, uh, performance is just poor, you know, raising network expectations and, and, and ultimately helping to fix those problems. It, it also um, kind of acknowledges the fact that these problems are hard in multi-domain environments, so it tries to provide a platform for uh, performing these measurements uh, across institutions um, and a way to kind of regularly run these and, and, and look at the results. Um, and then publish it in kind of an open way so, you know, we can all kind of share data and, and help uh, debug these problems. Um, I always like to, to recap this for everyone. I think most people, when they think of perf sonar and, and just, you know, based on deployment numbers, kind of the largest uh, type of deployment out there is what we call the perf sonar toolkit. Um, so basically, this is a CentOS ISO that we ship. Um, it can also be installed via, you know, YUM. Uh, a young package now and, and on Debian and Ubuntu, but, but most people I believe start with the, the CentOS image, um, which basically comes with your operating system and then on top of that all kind of the Persona tools and Web UI, but, but that's actually not the only way to install it. Um, we do have these other bundles um, kind of working from the top down, the, the tools which include basically just kind of the, the, the command line tools you can use to run the measurement, so iperf, iperf3, uh, kind of the basic B scheduler client, none of the uh, database stuff or anything like that to mean the maintain the schedule. But essentially, just something so you can run third party tests and, and all that. Um, and, and that's, I mean, honestly, that package you can put it on just about anything that you have on, on any host you have on the network, just uh, for debugging. Um, it's just all the command line stuff. And kind of the step above that is Persona test point, which includes all the tools. And then we get a full P scheduler deployment, which is what schedules the test. Um, uh, and all that, the mesh config agent, so you can, you know, participate in, we'll talk a lot about the mesh config later, um, but you can participate in these community kind of defined t uh, 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 meshes, um, and then lookup service registration, and then on, then building on top of that is the core, which is everything in test point, plus esmin, which is what we use for storing the results, so if you want to uh, run a local measurement archive. Um, and, you know, the idea behind, like, test point and core is, in particular, test point, if you have a bunch of you know, hardware that um, maybe isn't quite as beefy, so you don't want to be running the, the archive on those hosts. You can deploy a bunch of test points and then install like Esmin elsewhere. Um, and then obviously the last is the toolkit, which most people are um, aware of. But I, I just like to recap those because I know there's some confusion confusion about those for people, and um, some of those are useful in different contexts. Um, so let's look at kind of the changes we've made over the past few months because it's been a pretty significant year for uh, Personar. Um, so back in April, we did the final release of Persona 4.0, um, which was the first time we've bumped to that major number. It's always been 3.x for, um, I think, as long as I've worked on the project, which is about eight years now, I think. So, um, so this is a pretty significant change. Um, the reason we thought it was significant is that the first kind of sub-bullet there, which is the P-Scheduler uh, edition. So basically what P-Scheduler was uh, is uh, the replacement for what used to be BWTL and, and what we called regular testing. Essentially, it handles scheduling all the network measurements um, and uh, it, 
you know, we added a lot of other nice functionality in there. We, it's basically very extensible. So you can easily add new tools. You can easily add new archivers and ship stuff out. It's got a nice API for defining tests and looking at the schedule and stuff like that. In fact, Mark gave a nice talk about some of that uh, a couple of days ago, and that's actually on our YouTube channel, which is linked, uh, linked at the end of this if you're curious more about that, that particular subject. Um, but it, it basically changed a lot of things. Peace schedule kind of sits right in the middle of everything we do. So uh, swapping that in there uh, touched a lot of things. Um, and. and uh, uh, all that. Uh, then a couple other things we added were some new graphs um, that's based on some of the ESnet React work that we use on ESnet portal. If you're familiar with my.es.net, um, so we pulled some of that work in, and, and now we uh, uh, show kind of m multiple metrics a little bit cleaner than we used to. Uh, also, Mad Dash 2.0 uh, basically added some alerting features. So when um, I assume everybody's kind of familiar with the dashboard. So you have these grids that are red, green, and yellow. Now, when there's particular patterns, you can get emails um, uh, when when those patterns happen, or it just you know, in the UI, can call out certain patterns and highlight certain hosts that it thinks might be having problems. Um, and then we also added CentOS 7 and Debian 8 support. Um, and we'll talk a lot about the CentOS 7 support later. That that's kind of a a big change. Um, and as of, and you know, actually I didn't, I should have refreshed this. I think this number might be a week or two old now still, so it might be a little bit higher, but 72% of our users were on 4.0, which is pretty consistent with what we see um, uh, on uh, uh, in most of our releases. Uh, a big part of that is just people run auto-updates now. Um, so those releases get picked up a lot, a lot quicker than they used to. Um, that's good. We actually did do another uh, a minor release in August. Um, there really wasn't too much exciting in it. It was mostly just bug fixes and small changes that we added. Um, we did add Ubuntu 16 and Debian 9 support officially. Um, we'd, we'd had, you know, older versions of Debian and Ubuntu we supported for a few years now. So just kind of bringing that up to speed um, with those OSs. Uh, we added the ability to customize the P-Schedule report, um, which is something you can do upon initial release and some people asked for. Uh, we added some additional limits to pscheduler, uh, basically things like uh, the ability to uh, define limits based on the source and destination of, of the test and things like that. So if you, um, there's some things you can do now where if you want just only app tests to go out one interface and, and uh, your throughput test to go out another, you can actually do that within the pscheduler limits, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, so far the feedback for 4.0 and, and uh, the, the the subsequent 401 release has, has been uh, constructive and very positive, um, and so you know I think a lot of people uh, on on this call have contributed to to that kind of discussion and things like that. So you know keep it coming, and and I think uh, I think so far that that's gone quite well. Um, I do want to highlight just a few important dates um, while kind of we're all together here. So um, one is we've been sending email about this for quite some time. I think we just sent one a few days ago. Um, I think it's past Monday that. Uh, October 17th, which will be exactly six months after we've released 4.0, we will end of life for Sonar 3.5, and that's kind of the last last release in the 3.x series. Um, and as part of that, we will also be end of lifing Web 100. Um, so, I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise to people. We've talked about this for for quite some time, but you know, basically, you know, we're moving to CentOS 7, which has a, a, a different kernel version, which Web 100 is not compatible with. Um, and so, so we're dropping that. And as part of dropping that, that also means that NDT on persona boxes will not be supported. That doesn't mean NDT goes away. Um, people like MLab are still using it and supporting it. Just we're not going to be including it by default in the toolkit. And in fact, we didn't in this past 4.0 release. So it wasn't included by default. Um, so uh, so that, that's kind of the most imminent thing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in November, we're shooting for the 402 release, which is what we'll be talking about next, what's, what's coming in that. Um, we'll actually do a beta. This isn't on here probably in about in a couple weeks. So sometime in October, we'll probably do a beta. So you'll get your first look at that and then do the final sometime in November. Um, and then Q1 of next year, um, you notice these dates kind of get more vague the further out we go <laughs> to give us more wiggle room. Uh, and in the first quarter of next year, we'll be doing Persona 4.1, which is our next major release. Um, this is going to be an important one because we're not going to be releasing CentOS 6 packages uh, as of this time. Um, so that means that, uh, you know, we'd really like people to upgrade to CentOS 7 between now and then. Um, so, so you're ready for that. Um, and then that means six months after we do 4.1, which, you know, we don't know the exact date yet, but, you know, sometime early next year. 
Six months after that, which would be mid next year, so Q3 2018, we will end of life, you know, persona 4.0, just to be consistent with what else we've done, which also means that we'll no longer be supporting CentOS 6 versions of persona. So, um, you know, if you're looking at roughly a year from now, depending on where things exactly fall, we're, you know, plan not planning to support CentOS 6 anymore. So, you know, one thing to highlight here is, you know, people, if you're running CentOS, a CentOS distribution, you know, we kind of want to uh, start moving people towards CentOS 7. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that too uh, later on in the talk. Um, so that brings us to 402, which I think Mark is going to kick off this, this portion of things. Um, yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, yep. Good. Next slide, please. Um, uh, actually, let me let me also start by saying we're we're getting a little a little muddled in our version numbering. There's actually quite a bit of, of new material in 402, um, but we're we're still trying to work out uh, how we want to deal with that in the future. So this is this is slightly more than the than the very minor release that appears. Um, one of the big things that um, that we've we've implemented is uh, streaming archiving. Um, what we noticed when we first rolled 4.0 out uh, was that on on systems doing a lot of volume, there was quite a bit of CPU utilization. And that was caused mostly by the fact that, that the way the, uh, the archiver plugins were designed was that every time there was a, a, a measurement to, uh, to be archived, that we would start a, we'd start a program up to do it kind of one shot, let it do its business, terminate, and then let it rinse repeat. Um, what we did was in this version is we've made a change, and this is entirely internal, so it, won't, uh, it shouldn't really affect anything. I think there's only, only one other party other than us that's writing archiver plugins, and they've already been informed of this. Um, but archiver plugins will now operate in a streaming mode so that pscheduler will start the will start the programs up as they're needed it may start more than one if there's a whole lot of demand but each program as it lives will be fed multiple results during its lifetime and as pscheduler finds that they've become idle and, and not doing anything they get shut down um, what we've noticed in our test bed and what we think will probably also be noticed in production is that there should be a fairly significant uh, reduction in load on systems doing uh, doing high result volume. Um, so so that's uh, that's going to be something to look forward to. Next slide, please. Um, okay, one of the other things that we're we're going to be adding is um, is support for a language called JQ. Um, JQ is um, pretty much to JSON what uh, said an awk are to text. Um, it's, it's a tool for doing that. It, it started life as a command line tool. There's a library that we were able to integrate um, so that we can use it as part of, uh, as part of pscheduler. It has all kinds of functions and constructs for transforming the, the, what comes in and what goes out and for doing decision making and formatting output and that sort of thing. Um, and we're starting, to, we're starting to add this. We're actually going to add it in three places that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but one of the things that this gives us is a whole lot of uh, programmability by the end users in configuration and task specifications instead of having to write and install more code on the system. Um, there's quite a bit of flexibility in this thing. Uh, we found some really interesting applications for it. Uh, this was written by a guy named Steve Dolan, and you can find um, information and the manual on it uh, on his uh, his GitHub page, the link is down at the bottom there, stadolan.github.io slash jq. Next, please. Um, these are kind of the, the, the three or four places where we're going to be, um, where we're going to be uh, fielding jq in 4.0.2. Uh, the first is in archiving. One of the things that, that we started to look at as, as, we, um, as we wrote some of the archivers, like the HTTP archiver and the, the RabbitMQ archiver, is that it, what, what comes out of the system is not necessarily what has to go into the archive or whatever is going to be reading, say, a RabbitMQ uh, queue. Um, so we, we wanted to come up with a way to transform the results on the way out so that if there's a system that needs some additional information, it can be added uh, more as a configuration thing rather than having to write a custom program to do it. Additionally, we have a couple of spots in the limit system. Uh, where we're going to be adding support for JQ. Uh, you'll be able to make uh, pass-fail decisions based on the content of proposed tasks, and all that is is you can do things like you can say, if it's a throughput test and the bandwidth is greater than something or other, then reject it, or if it's less than whatever, accept it. Um, we'll be doing a workshop on this, by the way, so, so some of this may be a little vague, but sometime in the next couple months we'll do a little workshop on, uh, on how, this all, how this all fits in. 
Additionally, the Libit system has a facility in it for downloading lists of CIDR blocks to use to identify, um, to identify requesters. Um, and one of the things that you'll be able to do is, is modify that on the fly so that if you have something, for example, uh, Amazon Web Services is sort of famous for this. They have a, they have a, a JSON list that you can download that lists all of their uh, IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes. And what you'd be able to do is you'd be able to put a little piece of script in the configuration for that that says, when you download it, push it through this, this little piece of script. And what you get out of it, um, if you do the script properly, would just be the, the correct format that, that, the, um, that the identifier expects, which is just a, a, um, a list of, of CIDR blocks separated by new lines. Additionally, we started to develop a library with some standard functions that will probably be useful with, with pschedule. Right now, it only has three or four things in it. I suspect that there will be lots more as we, as we come up with them. Um, we do have a, a couple of ideas for things in the larval stage. Um, one of the things that we might, we might do, and again, this is just under consideration, but we would like to hear your feedback that this would be useful. Um, Apache has a really nice, uh, really nice facility in it for rewriting URLs. And we were thinking about putting something in uh, for rewriting uh, tasks as they come in based on, on your decision making. So for example, you might want to say, um, you know, if a task comes in and the bandwidth is eight gigabits and you really want to limit it to five, um, you could do that. Or you could, uh, for certain types of tests, you could do specific interfaces, that sort of thing. So more to come on that front. Next slide, please. Additionally, uh, we've had some new development from the University of Michigan, which has uh, joined, uh, joined the project this year. Uh, they have quite a bit of infrastructure where they use SNMP to monitor things. Um, one of the things that they're really interested in being able to do is to pull certain counters off of some of their network equipment during throughput tests. Um, so they've developed a set of plugins for collecting SNMP data uh, using sort of your bog standard, industry standard, um, uh, SNMP tools. And what the, the other thing that they'd like to be able to do, they have a single pane of glass system and their preferred format for input for that is SNMP traps. So in addition to uh, writing tools for collecting SNMP data, they've also uh, written an archiver that can take a result and convert it into a trap and then be sent to whatever destination you want. Um, so just to kind of sum up, uh, we've, the, they've added three new tests. These are, these are getting polished as we speak. Um, they should be out, um, they should be out with the, with the beta in a few weeks, and we may have to polish them up a little bit more before final release. Um, but you'll have a new test called SNMP GET, which is just a way to fetch uh, a group of SNMP values. We have another one called GET BGM that runs multiple tests in the backgrounds and can monitor for deltas. Uh, we've built a third one called SNMP SET, which is actually a reach out and touch something type test. That was, um, I think Michigan wanted that because they wanted to be able to reset certain counters and things like that in the process of it. And uh, they just decided that pscheduler was sort of a useful way to do that. Um, we have some new tools to back that up. Uh, one based on, a uh, couple based on the net SNMP package, one based on a Python package called PySNMP, um, and the SNMP trap archiver, of course, which generates traps from result data. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that, that we're adding in 4.2 is a thing called contexts, and this is this is actually a very uh, this is actually to satisfy a very narrow use case uh, that came out of uh, one of the partners. They have a, a multi-domain VPN product that they want to be able to do testing on, and they have machines that have multiple Linux network namespaces that are all sort of wired into each of the domains. Uh, and they wanted, what they wanted to be able to do, instead of having to run one host on each, uh, on each of the, the, the domains, they just wanted a way to say, okay, if we're going to do, do a measurement here, we want to be able to switch to whatever namespace uh, is appropriate for the domain that we're, or for the, uh, for the VPN that we're going to be testing. So there's currently just one plugin that does this. It just changes namespaces before the, um, before the, before the, the, uh, the measurement is run. Um, and if we come up with others, I, I actually sort of racked my brains a little bit trying to find another application and, and couldn't. Um, so this, this may be the one plugin that we have for that for quite a while. But it is done with a plugin mechanism, so as we come up with other things, then we'll be able to, um, we'll be able to, to integrate those. Next slide, please. Um, as usual, there's sort of a, a raft of, of smaller things. Uh, we have, we've added some tools for troubleshooting limit configuration files because they are sort of complex and it's much easier to, uh, 
be able to kind of validate and, and test those out without having to put it into the system, restart the system and, and, and do trial and error with it. We've added some additional ways to search for uh, tasks in the REST API. This was driven mostly by increasing the performance of mesh config and some other applications that we may have in the future. Uh, but it does it does open up some more some more options for pulling things out, and as usual, of course, we've done the usual the, the usual raft of, of minor enhancements and fixes, all of which will be out in the release notes um, when we uh, when we release this version. I think that's it for me, so I will hand it back to Andy. Actually, uh, a few more you can jump into for one. Ah, yes, that's right. I forgot there is something. I'm trying to shirk my responsibilities early. Um, <clears throat> so as Andy mentioned, we're looking for we're looking for this spring to to put um, Persona 4.1 out, uh, and we're looking to add a few major features to that. Uh, one is, and again, these are these are planned, and and some may be shuffled depending on on uh, on what happens in the course of, of development. But um, uh, the first thing we're looking at is um, is the concept of resource management. And this is really mostly to solve the problem of having uh, pools of ports. As things, as things stand now, we sort of say, you know, this test uses this port or this range of ports, and it just becomes really difficult for people with firewalls to keep up. So what we'll be doing is developing uh, something where we have pools of TCP and UDP ports that each of the, uh, each of the tests can draw from at runtime so that um, you can essentially when you once you've configured what the pool what the pool is going to be like what the port range will be you can configure your firewall once and everything will stay within those confines something else that uh, there's been some interest in is is uh, something that we've dubbed uh, remotely supervised runs with local archiving uh, there were a couple of users that have had sort of a difficult problem in that the places where they are actually doing the testing can't reach their archivers um, so we're looking at, at coming up with a way for uh, for you to submit a task to a to a machine and say, here's here it is, but you need to submit it over here as well and let it run and collect the results when it comes back and then do the archiving locally. Um, it's I guess in some ways it's sort of a, a firewall bypasser um, within uh, you know I guess within certain limits. Um, additionally, we're looking at um, some ways to do some better ways to do run control. Right now, the way things are set up, you can basically cancel a task, and that will cancel any future runs of it. Um, we are looking to be able to do things like stop a run midstream and, and preempt uh, runs that are pending, so that, for example, if somebody on the local machine is, is running some CLI stuff and they don't want to wait around for whatever else happens to be in the queue, uh, we'll have a way to do that. Next slide, please. Uh, mentioned task rewriting uh, earlier, I think, but uh, I'll, we'll cover that again. Um, that's just really so we can make on the fly changes to task as they're, tasks as they're ingested. Uh, and this will let us do some things that we can't do with the limit system. Uh, additionally, there's going to be a whole bunch more new plugins, maybe not a whole bunch, but uh, we're, uh, we're looking at starting development on one to do uh, network traffic capture, which will probably be backed up by Wireshark. Um, we have a couple of little logistical things we have to figure out in order to make that work. Um, additionally, we're also going to be uh, delving a little more into application monitoring, which is not something we've looked at previously, but uh, there are there are users that are interested in this, and, and fortunately, because of the way uh, the way pscheduler is structured, it makes it real easy to write new plugins to to to, uh, to monitor these things. So probably we'll be doing things like HTTP response and and maybe a, a couple of other things. There's been mentioned in recent weeks about maybe also doing some tests at uh, layers of the network below layer three. Um, that's really still in the larval stage, but it's come up as well. Um, for example, uh, uh, Michigan, who's, who's been behind the SNMP stuff, has expressed some interest in doing uh, voice over IP quality testing, so they may, they may be developing some, uh, some plugins to do that as well. Finally, in 4.1, we'll see the retirement permanently of BWCTL. Uh, since 4.0 was released, we've had some compatibility codes so that uh, systems that ran 4.1 and 3.5 could operate with each other. Uh, we will be taking that out and disabling it in 4.1, which is probably a, a good impetus to upgrade. Um, so there's uh, there, I guess, is your is your six month notice that uh, that that's going to happen. Uh, I think that's all there is for me this time. Let's see if I got it right. Ah, nope. There's lots more. <laughs> Need to look at these a little a little more closely. Uh, there's also been some development for a measurement protocol called TWAMP, which stands for the Two Way Active Measurement Protocol. 
Um, it's very similar to OAMP in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that it does differently is it doesn't combine one way and round trip time measurement uh, simultaneously. Um, the, its round trip time measurements are a lot more robust when it comes to uh, variations in uh, timekeeping. Uh, much like OAMP, this runs as a, as a daemon. There's a TWAMPD that, that accepts and, and helps out with measurement requests. Um, there's a, there'll be a program called TWPing to do measurements from the CLI, uh, from the command line, uh, and probably we'll come up with something that does, uh, that, that does the same thing as PalStream does that produces uh, streaming measurements. One of the things that made TWAMP attractive is that it is very widely implemented on routers and switches, and that means that those devices can act as TWAMP servers, and that gives you a whole lot more targets for measurements. Next slide, please. Oops. Sorry about that. Must have clicked the wrong thing here. Uh, let me reshare. Oh well. Sorry about that. Okay. And they can edit this out when we're done, right? <laughs> yeah, right. We were hoping to avoid this, but not switching, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's try this again. Sorry about that. All right. And today, I just don't know where my presentation ends, which doesn't help either. You're almost done. Okay. Yep. There we go. Um, so, yeah, so, so just carry on from where we were. Uh, we will be writing uh, tests and tools to go with this. Actually, the tests are already there. We already have a round trip time test and a latency test, so we'll be um, we'll be uh, we'll be developing tools that uh, that, that implement. TWAMP and what comes out of them will look pretty much the same as uh, as everything else. Um, so we'll be able to produce, as I said, two different metrics, latency and RTT with this. Um, and it'll be shown in the perks on our graphs just as everything else does. You won't actually be able to tell the difference. Um, we have had some, some external contributors who, I don't know, I guess maybe want to remain anonymous, um, but that work has been, has been made possible thanks to them. Next. Okay, and you are officially done now. So. Here's where I'm going. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next one, uh, the next thing that we're looking at for 401 is uh, Docker support. So if you're on our persona user list, this has been a very popular topic uh, the past few months. <laughs> um, it seems like about once a week we get some type of question uh, on trying to get persona going in some type of container, uh, Docker or otherwise. Um, so we actually have some Docker's that are kind of just labeled as beta that are in uh, Docker Hub. Uh, there's a link to it uh, in, in the slides right here that you can pull down. It's um, so I talked about the bundles earlier. So there's the tools bundle and the test point bundle that we have um, in in Docker Hub um, that seem to work pretty well. There's some weird caveats like this is just a Docker thing, not even a Persona thing. Like ping doesn't work because it just you know Docker does some weird stuff with ICMP, um, but uh, uh, it looks it looks pretty promising. Um, you know, getting a Docker image is not a particularly difficult thing to do. Um, so, you know, the reason we're dragging our feet on this is not really necessarily the execution of creating the Docker images. It's you know basically deciding how we want to package these things. Um, in particular, the toolkit. I, I know we get a lot of questions about running the toolkit in um, in um, Docker, which. Uh, which you can completely do, uh, you know, it has ways to run kind of multiple services, but Do Docker kind of has this idea of microservices. So how we, you know, divvy up things like the web interface and admin, and, you know, Postgres and all those databases we run, we're, we're still kind of trying to figure out the best way for doing that and keeping everything up to date and, and, and all that good stuff. So it's kind of really more uh, just figuring out the organization <laughs> of the services as opposed to actually building the images. But but um, if you are interested in building your own images or, or using what we have there, we do have um, um, that stuff on Docker Hub, but you can either use as a starting point or you know just run directly. Um, you can actually run it like on your Mac, which is kind of cool, um, and you know do all your piece or stuff, and, and it's kind of neat. So um, so that that's something we're definitely looking at and kind of you know cleaning up uh, and finalizing. Um, and then uh, the next big thing that I want to get into, and this is really what I'm going to spend the, m most of the rest of the presentation on and kind of go into depth. So, so the big feature for 4.1 is um, kind of like in 4.0, we kind of overhauled the scheduling aspect of things and, and introduced pscheduler. Um, we, we want to overhaul essentially the mesh config side of things, um, and we're actually going to rename it psconfig. Um, and so I, I think 
probably, like I said earlier, a lot of you are probably familiar with the mesh config. Um, so basically it allows you to publish this central file that defines all your tests and then uh, all the hosts participating in the test can point at it, you know, download it, they'll, they'll automatically build their tests. And then likewise, if you have a dashboard, um, you know, running mad dash, uh, we have a little agent that can download that file and build the, the dashboard for you, right? And, um, you know, the introduction of this a few years ago, I don't even remember, maybe it was five years ago now or something like that, um, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, a pretty important milestone, I think, for Persona. I, I think a lot of the communities now are kind of built around these meshes. Um, and it's done a lot of, of really good stuff. Um, but, you know, over the course of those years, since we've introduced it, a lot of stuff has changed underneath the hood with Persona. Um, in particular, piece guys I'm not even sure we had Mad Dash when the mesh config first came out. They were probably roughly the same time. Um, but anyways, we've kind of gotten to a point. If you if you mess around with the mesh config files, you'll notice you know there's a lot of kind of legacy terms in there and and things like that. And you know we're kind of limited. We've got all this great extensibility on the piece scheduler side. We've got some good extensibility on the Mad Dash side, and a lot of the kind of mass with the mesh config. So so we kind of want to revisit that and um, um, you know see if we can make that experience even better and kind of bring the mesh config up to up to date with all the other stuff. Um, I do want to talk briefly about how kind of people are using mesh config today just because I know um, some of this has been a topic at, at just a few talks you know over the, the past few months. Um, so right now kind of who uses mesh config so generally you know if you have just a couple hosts you don't necessarily need mesh config you could use it for that but it's really kind of shines and kind of have medium to large size deployments so that could be internal deployment so on ESNet you know we have about 50 measurement hosts um, it used to actually be about 80 because we separated the, the latency measurements and throughput measurements but we've combined those into one host with multiple interfaces in the past few years so we've got about 50 of them um, you know so we obviously uh, you know when I first started yes a few years ago and we were running these first summer tests, I'd actually have to like log into the host and um, I don't even remember the name of the config file back then, but there, there was a config file basically where you'd find all your tests. And um, I, I remember, uh, you know, it was really hard to tell <laughs> why stuff was broken and stuff would get out of sync. Like one host would have different set of test parameters than the other, right? So, so the mesh config kind of made all that much, much easier. Um, likewise, what's been really cool um, with the mesh config is there's a lot of communities out there, which I'm sure well, pretty much probably all of you are part, part of one in some shape or the other that have kind of, you know, multiple institutions have kind of come together and built these meshes and, you know, point their hosts at it and kind of build these dashboards and, and gather around it, which is, which has been a really positive development. Um, kind of on the flip side of that too, kind of, you know, the law of unintended consequences, or, I mean, I guess you could kind of becoming, um, you know, Test design is still kind of a hard problem, right? Even, even if you define a mesh, defining a, a good mesh and even measuring or, you know, defining what a good mesh is, uh, is still a challenge. So, you know, we've kind of seen this case where um, there's some meshes out there that are just enormous, right? They're like 100 by 100 or bigger, right? Which is which is cool that that actually works and that you can actually build a mesh that size, but it, it starts to become kind of, you know, it's hard to notice patterns and derive useful information out of it. Um, and I mean, I think part of the reason this stuff is happening is, is also kind of the result of how the mesh config is, is designed, right? So um, uh, some of the terminology, like I said, is outdated. It's not always clear how to do things. So it's just easy to add a host and have a mesh. So we have, you know, other topologies in there like disjoint and stuff that people aren't aware of and obviously discovery stuff. Um, the other piece of that too is, you know, right now what we have isn't great for writing new tools that maybe kind of more intelligently build these meshes automatically. Like if you had a tool that had some knowledge of your topology and it could kind of, you know, um, calculate uh, what what the best, you know, link coverage and stuff like that of, of your test, that would be kind of cool. Um, and we don't have a great platform for doing that. Um, it, I mean, test design is always going to be hard, but, uh, you know, I don't know that we're doing ourselves a, a ton of favors in some of the stuff that's there. So I just kind of want to highlight that a little bit. Um, so let's look before. The current, how the mesh config currently works, so we can kind of see why some of these changes um, are occurring. Um, so, and th this might just be informative for some of you who have to work with the mesh config, because I know this is confusing um, because there's a lot of steps, which is something we want to address. Um, so, if we look at this diagram, this kind of shows how what we call the mesh config agent works. So, this blue circle in the middle, that's basically a program um, that runs on all the hosts that are running tests in a particular mesh. Um, and its job is to download a JSON file and basically build all the tests. So um, kind of the process for that, um, if we start at the top here, you know, we've got this little person. It's, you know, pro probably some of the people on this call, right? And you open up a text editor and we have this file that's in what's called config general format. It kind of looks like an Apache config file if you've ever used it. Um, 
it's got, you know, XML tags, but it's not XML. I think at least once or twice a year, we get a email on the user list complaining that our XML is not valid in that file. And uh, it's because it's not XML, it's this config general format that's common in the Perl world. But anyways, uh, you, ha you have this file format, right? Um, and the idea behind that format, you know, years ago when we find this is that was a little bit easier to manually edit than maybe JSON or some other format. So I guess that, that that's why we have it. Yeah, you can, you know, form your own opinion whether that's true or not. Um, so basically, once you define this file by hand, uh, you feed it through this little script we have called build JSON that, that converts it to JSON and you throw it on a web server somewhere and someone can download it. Um, another way you can generate this JSON is we have this thing called the mesh config GUI, which is still kind of in beta and, and as part of 401, we'll be developing that forward further and hopefully remove that tag from it. Um, we just, you know, had, that there was some development shuffling that we had to do. So, um, but, but hopefully for one that'll come along. But anyways, that mesh config GUI skips this config general format entirely and, and outputs this JSON. Um, and then our kind of third main way of defining tests is this thing called the uh, tool, which is a toolkit GUI. So when you install the Perp Center toolkit, probably most of you are familiar with this, you click on the little configuration tab and you go to your tests and you define everything there. It actually doesn't uh, talk about JSON at all. It actually has a third format, uh, which is in the mesh config agent task.com, and it's kind of there for some legacy reasons that it, that it outputs, right? So the mesh config agent kind of sits in the middle of all this. So it pulls in all the JSON, it actually converts the stuff it gets from JSON into the, the mesh config agent task.com uh, format over here on the on the right. Um, and, and you can manually stick stuff into mesh config agent task.com too, this little guy over here, right? So it shoves everything in there, then sucks it back in, and then it from there figures out. Um, uh, uh, what piece schedule servers it needs to talk to and talks to all of them and submit tasks and into all that. So, um, so there may be some obvious flaws in this process as I'm going through that. So, <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, this is kind of, this is what happens today, um, right? So it's a little complicated. There's a lot of formats, lots of steps. Um, so we're hoping to clean that up and I'll show in a moment what, what we're hoping a new one will look like. Um, so the other piece of this is we also have what's called the mesh config GUI agent, which is similarly named, but the, the GUI aspect is that its job is to not talk to P scheduler, it's instead its job is to generate a mad dash configuration file, right? So this is what you use to build your dashboards. Um, and so the format for getting into the, or the process for getting into the JSON format is, is much the same as it was, um, or as it is for the mesh config agent. Uh, if you're dividing stuff through the toolkit GUI though, um, or manually adding that, mesh config agent test files here, there's no way to feed that into the mesh config GUI agent currently, right? That's just kind of off here on the side and mesh config GUI agents know anything about it. And um, so if, if you're finding tests on the toolkit, there's not a way to generate a dashboard, which, you know, you may not need to because it's, you know, your host testing to a bunch of places, but, but it's not even an option at the moment. Um, so I can't, I, um, so this also there's an issue of extensibility that I alluded to earlier. So the mesh config, it basically uses all these Perl classes and has kind of a fixed set of properties. So what that means is if like we had the SNMP plugin that, that Mark was talking about, um, we actually have to write a bunch of code to to actually get the mesh config to support the SNMP plugin, even though um, you know P scheduler just you know it drops right into P scheduler, and even on the Mandash side, it has all the constructs necessary if you to uh, to you know if you wanted to check SNMP data, it has all the constructs necessary to do that. You wouldn't have to write any code. Basically, all Mad Dash is doing is executing a um, a command that ha expects a certain form output format, and based on that, it can color stuff. You know, red, green, um, yellow, or or equivalent. Um, all that. So we kind of got this this thing in the middle that um, is kind of makes things not look as extensible as as maybe the, the side pieces are. So. Um, uh, like I said, you know, we've got all these different formats, so we have to update the code in multiple places. So all these formats can accept the, the changes, like when we add the SMP thing, and and um, uh, yeah, it's just kind of a pain, right? And and this this diagram kind of highlights some of those areas where they have to go. And and what it doesn't show actually is on the GUI agent side, there's some further changes they have to make, right? So um, that's all that. So um, you know, I, I'm kind of highlighted how things work. There there is a lot of good, like uh, like I said earlier, from the mesh config. Um, I mean, I think pulling down the, the pull model seems to be a pretty good way to pass around tests to our users and not have to worry about firewalls and things like that. Um, there actually are a lot of good advanced features that I didn't cover too much in here that, we, you know, we definitely want to maintain. There's these things called host classes. So you can say things like, okay, I've got this mesh. And basically, instead of saying host A, B, C, and D, 
say include all hosts that are in this IP range, right? That that download this mesh and, and things like that. So you can kind of do some cool automatic stuff there um, that that you can leverage a little bit. Um, another thing we have is something called address maps um, already, which I don't we don't want to lose. Um, so what these are useful for is a lot of times you'll have dashboards or tests. I was actually just said had to set one up today for one of our engineers at ESNet. Um, they'll bring up like an Oscar, or they'll bring up an Oscar circuit or a layer two circuit or um, whatever, and the the host talking on each end of that circuit will have one set of IPs. Now those same hosts might talk to other hosts on circuits, right? But they'll use a different set of IPs. So these address maps basically allow us to define in the mesh that hey, when host A is talking to host B, use this set of addresses. But when host A is talking to host C, use this other set of private IP addresses, um, right? And then you can draw a dashboard, and it, it looks pretty, and it's still a nice you know square and and all that. Um, uh, so, so there's some good features like that. Um, that mesh config agent task.com file is actually kind of nice from a debugging perspective to kind of have everything sucked in together and then output just to see what it expects, like Pete's guys would have. Um, I don't know how useful it is necessarily from a configuration aspect, but it is useful from a debugging aspect um, just to see what, what it thinks should be uh, in Pete's guys, or if, if you understand that format at the very least. Um, and, uh, you know, the code we have in place that we just wrote the last round to actually maintain the last uh, set up piece schedule tasks and piece schedule is actually, you know, seems to be pretty solid. So, um, you know, that's not necessarily stuff we wanna wanna lose. Um, the be it bad, I've talked a lot about, you know, the process is still confusing. Um, you know, the, the various configuration formats certainly don't help. Um, I already talked about the extensibility uh, 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 downfall and, and the config general format, you know, it was put there with the best intentions that it was, you know, easy to get it, but I'm not sure that's actually true. Uh, in practice. And now I'm getting a, a spinner again. My computer's like going crazy today. So give me one second here. Uh, so sorry about that. Let me, I have to restart PowerPoint here. <laughs> uh, Okay. All right, I'll try this one more time. Um, uh oh. All right, I apologize. There's something that doesn't like here. Uh, just give me one more shot at this. Uh, so while Andy's uh, getting that ready, uh, I'll remind everybody, if you have any questions, uh, start to type them into the chat room, and we'll start to answer those when he's all done. Okay. Okay. All right, so yep, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here too, so we can do some questions. Um, all right, so I think I did the good and the bad of the mesh config, so the ugly is is um, a bunch of the references to Persona, buoy and legacy stuff that's in the syntax. So, um, so okay, so given all that, right, we think it's time for a refresh uh, of the mesh config, like we don't have the other components, we're calling it PS config, like we talked about. Um, so it's kind of some of the goals for this is, obviously to consolidate those configuration formats I talked about, so just have a single JSON format. Um, increase the extensibility, right? So we have all this good code in pscheduler and it has the ability to ask it if stuff is valid and things like that. There's no need to kind of reinvent the wheel there. You know, we, we can leverage a lot of that work. So, you know, we can we can more easily drop in new things like when someone has a new SMP plugin or, or whatever. We don't necessarily need to go and chase the mesh config. It'll just be able to support that as soon as pscheduler supports it. Um, clean up a lot of the terminology I talked about. Um, one idea, so about editing these things instead of, you know, kind of requiring a text editor, we already have the GUI, but maybe also writing a nice CLI, maybe even interactive CLI or something like that to help build those. So you have help messages and all that stuff, but don't have to remember the exact syntax would, would, uh, would be helpful. Um, and, you know, you know, these are kind of all things we want to build and kind of reorganize things into these couple packages I, uh, I talked about. We, we have essentially equivalent packages of those now. 
Um, so the PS config publisher, so we'd have all the tools like the CLI I talked about for gen generating the JSON files, the PS config pscheduler, which would be like your mesh config agent, which downloads them and, and submits it to pscheduler, and the PS config mad dash, which, uh, which would build your dashboards, right? And so now we kind of have this new diagram that looks more like this, right? You kind of have this single JSON format. Um, you could have somebody edit it by hand if they really so desired. We could have the CLI generate it. The toolkit GUI would actually generate this JSON format as well, and the mesh config GUI would generate as well. It all gets sucked into the kind of the agent and then distribute it out, right? So much cleaner um, and all that. And then a similar deal with the, the GUI side of things and generating the dashboards, right? It would kind of just suck in one type of format and push it out. And we'd even get the ability, if we really so desired, that if you want to make dashboards out of what you find on Toolgate GUI, you could actually easily do so. So um, I do have a little quick example of, of part of uh, what we're thinking for the JSON. We do have, uh, you know, poke around our, our GitHub repo, we do actually have a schema uh, defined for this new format that we're working with. Obviously, things are subject to change, but um, uh, you'll see, I, I know it's hard to read, and that's kind of partially the point, too, is on the left side here, we kind of have the old format, right, where if you, all you're doing is defining, it, essentially, it's a single uh, uh, measurement archive where you want measurements to go. And currently, you have to do that essentially four times, um, one for each of our main data types that, that are supported in mesh configs, the trace route, the throughput stuff, uh, the, the OAMP stuff, and, and the ping stuff. And you have to specify the URL twice. It's read URL and write URL, which in I think every case now with Esmond, um, uh, it's uh, basically always the same. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, there's things that we can do to consolidate that, right? Where um, now we have this definition where we'll have it with the archives. You kind of give it some label just so you know what it is. You specify what type it is. It's an Esmond type. And then you'll specify the URL once and, and, and you're done. And you can reference that anywhere that needs to write to that. Um, and it doesn't really matter what the data type is. Um, and the other idea is this blob with the archiver admin and data part. That, that's exactly what it looks like in pscheduler JSON world. So you can feed that to the to pscheduler and it can tell you if it's valid or not, right? So if you write a new type of archiver, like an SMMP trap archiver we're talking about, you don't have to add anything to to the, the PS config code that it could just get some into pscheduler and it could, you know, give the thumbs up or thumbs down if that's allowed. Um, here's kind of a little more internal diagram. I don't want to go into too much detail because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, but basically, you know, you can, you suck in, you, you aggregate the JSON, you've got this configuration file, you suck in the options, you kind of feed it to a validator, which would work with a P scheduler, what we call a sys server, to kind of help validate everything and make sure, you know, uh, there's plugins that exist that support it and, and, and all that stuff. And then we'd submit it to the task manager, which would, you know, distribute things out like it does now. Um, so probably one question that comes to mind if you're already running a mesh config is what's the backward compatibility going to look like for this? Um, so we do want to pr provide some backward compatibility. We don't want to like break everything for people, which is you know kind of what we've been trying to do with these big changes over the past few years. Um, so I, I think initially we might have the PS config packages convert any um, you know any existing config files you have. Those will get converted and upgrade to the new format. Um, if you have the central file, you know, and so presumably you might have the central file, right? And you'll have a mixture of old hosts and new hosts that are trying to read it. Um, we should be able to do some stuff with the, the user agent headers and some Apache rules to kind of serve up the correct version, depending on um, if they're running the old client or the new client. Um, so we'll do that for a while. Um, and then if you're running the new agent, the PS config agent, right, you might be want to have to read an old file. So I think probably what we'll have to do is, is keep around. It'd be nice to just ditch, ditch that and just say, you know, complain if, if it couldn't read it. But probably what we'll do is um, just keep around some of the old code to, to for, parse that and convert it over um, as it reads that, right? And, and then on the mesh config GUI side, like I said, we have this mesh config GUI that's kind of a beta. The idea is that it'll be able to, to generate both and serve up both, um, which shouldn't, shouldn't be too particularly difficult. So that's that plan. And then kind of the last big thing I want to talk about before we go into questions is, so that's kind of the end of PS config. I just want to highlight one more time, kind of getting ready for 4.1, right? So we talked about this already a little bit. Um, so we're dropping support for the OSs listed there. CentOS 6 is probably the biggest one just in terms of percentage of deployments out there. The vast majority of people are on CentOS 6. And we'll also be dropping Debian 17 and Ubuntu 14. So, so that may or may not affect you. Um, you know, just in favor of, of the newer versions of Debian and Ubuntu that, that we already support. Um, if you're on one of those, you, you are going to need to upgrade if you want to get 4.1. Um, Right, and then we will sub drop drop support after that. Um, I think in all my monkeying around, I maybe grabbed a, a slightly older version of these slides, but there's also a bullet there. So one thing um, with CentOS 7 that we've been exploring uh, the past 
week or two or so, um, in particular Jason and I with uh, carriers, we have actually seen some weirdness with retransmits on uh, CentOS 7. Um, and we think it's something happening at the OS layer. Um, so yes, that's about to, to upgrade a bunch of our hosts to CentOS 7, but we are trying to understand that better. So basically we're seeing, um, in particular, uh, I was noticing it coming coming from CentOS 6 host to CentOS 7 host, uh, 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 a pretty consistent retransmits that you don't see in, in the other direction. Um, so we're trying to understand those better. So it'd be great if, you know, people um, in this community could, uh, uh, you know, upgrade some of their hosts or if you have kind of look for similar things and share some of your data. It's, it's not it's not clear that it's actually even significant, but we need to understand it because, it, you know, you get all these pink dots on your graph, right? And it looks like there's an issue. So we need to understand if there really is an issue or, or or if there isn't, and, and also, you know, maybe the side of that is if there isn't, maybe we need to reevaluate how we're presenting uh, those retransmits. So, um, you know, that, that might be incentive or disincentive for you, depending on <laughs> your interest to, to upgrade. But, you know, we would like uh, to get a little bit more data on that um, type of thing, and, and having more CentOS 7 deployments out there would, would certainly help with that. Um, it's also worth noting as, uh, as uh, Mark already did that B2CL will go away. So, you know, that's a big reason to try and get people upgraded to 4.0 uh, by, by this time. So um, that's all I have. So I guess that needs some time for questions. Um, so thanks for your patience while those slides, uh, I remember while PowerPoint was losing its mind on me. But um, yeah, but, you know, basically that's a recap of everything we hit. And uh, oh yeah, there's my, my retransmit button or bullet. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks everyone. And I guess we can take questions now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Um, so while people type in their questions, I can ask a, a couple. With with the uh, sort of the the use of P scheduler, and now that it's going to be the, the the main scheduler for all the tools, and there won't be any tools that don't use P scheduler, are we any closer to really getting a fully automated tool, whether it be developed by Perfson or but developed by somebody else? that can truly help us pinpoint problems that are found on the network using multiple sorts of metrics. Yeah. So like a tool, like kind of more of an analysis tool. Um, so that's definitely something we talked about in the develop, uh, in, in the development group internally. Um, the problem was kind of a resource issue and that we kind of felt like we needed um, kind of some of this, this, this PS config stuff first to kind of clean up the foundation. So I think it was kind of a resource issue. I think that we have all these pieces in place so we could do that much easier. And I would love if, if, you know, somebody was interested in tackling that before we get around to it um, or even in conjunction with us, that, that would be great. Um, so uh, I don't know that in 4.1 we will be getting that tool, but I think after 4.1 that's, that's very high on the list, if not top. <laughs> So. I think I think there's also a pretty good chance you may see some of those sort of things coming from elsewhere. Uh, we held a, a, a workshop earlier this week on how to use the uh, the API that P Scheduler uh, provides to um, to have the system do measurements for you. And I think at least one or two of the one or two of the people who were interested in it in the first place, um, and actually I think probably. I would I would swear I spoke to somebody at IU who was interested in doing this, but but there's there is interest out there in using um, using Personar as a building block for uh, for other systems, and we now have we now have things in place where that becomes possible. Okay, well, thanks both of you for that answer. Uh, we don't have any questions yet, but I'll ask another one. Um, are you going to make the instructions available for how you've traditionally built? the Web 100 package on CentOS 6 uh, so that somebody in the community, if they really value it that much, has a way to sort of continue on with CentOS 6 and Web 100 as a, a testing tool for campus? Uh, that, that's probably a good suggestion. We actually have that. It's um, it's on our uh, wiki on, on GitHub. I'm sure no one knows where that is, though. So um, we should probably start including that in our, our reminder emails because there'll be a couple more coming out between now and October 17th for those interested. And, and those instructions have been updated and are, are pretty good for how to uh, how to patch that. So, uh, yeah, we, we can certainly share those. Like I said, they're already on a public site. Just probably no one knows where to go look. So, um, yeah, that, that would be, be an easy thing to do and probably a good thing to do. And then along those lines, and this is more of a forward-looking question, so I'm not sure if Mark or you want to tackle this one. 
how challenging would it be for somebody to sort of approach wanting to do a web-based tester using pscheduler and any of the metrics that are underneath it, you know, iperf, whatever the case may be, to create a new NDT? You want me to take that one, Andy? Yeah, go for it. I know you've thought about it a little bit. Yeah, already, so. um, I, I've actually had some 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 interesting and, and pretty lengthy discussions with people about it. Um, the the good part is that the the API is 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 there, and it's I mean all it is is it's just a it's it's all just REST and JSON. So theoretically, there's there's nothing stopping us from developing some specific tests and tools for servicing things that are running in a web browser, and we would just have to develop something where. You know, the, we'd have to have some piece of of, uh, of JavaScript or something in the web browser that contacts. It it, it it does pretty much what any other P scheduler client would do. It would have to contact the server, say, "I want to do this test, get approval to do it, um, get a, a time scheduled, and then when the time comes up, it would have to do its upload or download test. Um, you know, whatever we're going to do. So there's there's nothing that architecturally forbids it, um, and we don't need Web 100 to do that sort of thing. Um, it's it's one of those things. I know there are a lot, I've I've bumped into several people who are interested in having that sort of thing, and I think in our case, it's it's just another one of those things. We have a million things we really love to do, and we're a little short on resources. Okay. Uh, so nobody has typed in any questions. So I think that's probably it for today. Uh, so I want to thank you both for for giving your time. Um, if you can, please just send me your slides and I'll make sure that that gets posted and then I'll take this recording and we'll uh, give it to the training group since I see Scott on the line and he can convert this into a, uh, a YouTube channel as well. So thanks to everybody. Next week we're going to have uh, University of Hawaii giving a talk and they're going to be talking about uh, performance debugging, so using Perf Sonar to, to fix some problems. So hope everybody has a good weekend and we'll talk to everybody soon.